Uh, hi everyone and uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, uh, great to see so many here and uh, great to see that the interest in this very, very special topic has, has been so big. Uh, uh, we weren't expecting that, but that's, 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 that's amazing. So, so thanks everyone for, for joining now. And I, I think we have a, a great day ahead of us. Uh, as always, we have Christian uh, with us. Hi, Christian. Hello. Hi. Uh, hi. And uh, then we have the, a guest today, also a guest speaker, uh, Bertrand uh, Mayo from uh, Jek. Hi, Bertrand. Hello, everybody. Hi. Great to have you here, Bertrand, and uh, look forward hearing about uh, hearing uh, your presentation today. And uh, as we always do before, uh, we start just a short announcement. Next week, next Thursday, we have a we, we, we have an extra, we have an, a webinar, which will be on a topic that many of you, uh, many of our commercial users have a large interest in, and that's design of sheet pile walls. Um, we will have a, 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 a slightly different webinar than uh, we've had previously. So it will be, uh, the focus will be very much on practical examples and we will uh, compare Optum uh, with other uh, programs on the market. And we will try to show that Optum is, is both uh, fast, uh, not maybe faster, but very fast, and also produces very optimal solutions. So if you're interested in producing uh, uh, designs with, let's say, minimum amount of steel, this is a good webinar to attend. All right, so back to today's webinar on with the topic, the use of limit analysis in tectonic studies. And um, Bertrand is here to present. And before I give you the word, uh, just a small note at the bottom of the screen, we have the, the Q&A field. Uh, please use that for uh, asking, uh, uh, putting questions forward. After the presentation, which uh, Bertrand has informed me is around 45 minutes, we will have a Q&A session where these questions will be answered. And uh, yeah, that's pretty much it. So uh, please, Bertrand, uh, the word is yours. Thank you, Jorgen. Uh, welcome to everybody. I'm glad to give this webinar today on the invitation of Jorgen Christian. Uh, these are people we've been working with uh, for, for several years now, <clears throat> and uh, Optum is certainly one of the major tools that we use. Um, so I'll start with sharing my screen now, and start with the, the seminar. All right, I hope you all see the title and uh, the first slide. Um, it's okay. You confirm, Jorgen. You see yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, it's perfect. Very good. It's perfect. Yeah. Uh, at the Jack Lab in uh, Sergi Paris University, which is the northwest of Paris, about twenty miles from Paris, um, we've been uh, working with limit analysis now for almost uh, fifteen years. The first paper we produced in two thousand and six, uh, using limit analysis for tectonic studies. Um, I, oh, I would like to apologize for also for geoscience people who have had to choose between attending EGU uh, online uh, meeting and, and today I didn't realize when we fixed the date that, that it would be uh, right during the, the online uh, EGU uh, convention. So, um, well, let's go. Uh, there's a lot of people uh, involved in the, what I'm going to present today. Uh, major collaborators are here. Uh, some people from CY, my university. Uh, Yves Leroy is really uh, the brain behind all the theoretical developments uh, that I will present. Uh, it's really thanks to, to a meeting uh, between Yves Leroy and Christian Krabenhoft several years ago when Christian uh, uh, was visiting uh, the uh, Polytechnique in France where Yves was teaching and uh, they met and uh, Christian explained what was limit analysis uh, to Yves at that point. It was already known a little bit by Ecole Polytechnique. And this is when we really started to drop the approach, theoretical approach, where we were minimizing the, the total dissipation uh, to adopt the limit analysis approach. 
So that's the roots uh, of, of, the, of the developments. We had ten PhD students, of which I will present the results, postdocs, master students, and we are funded um, mostly by Total and Swiss Topo and my own university, CY, uh, because the interest there, the applications of that is, is, is in the exploration of hydrocarbon resources. So these studies are trying to help the uh, structural interpretation of the underground, uh, exploration also of uh, repository sites for uh, nuclear waste. Um, <clears throat> okay, let me now explain a little bit the tectonic settings now, because I know I'm talking uh, mainly to people coming from geotechnics. So it's important to explain a bit what, what tectonic structures we look at. Uh, first, we look at what is called fold and thrust belts, which are regions, usually the foothills of major uh, mountain belts. And in the foothills, uh, the sedimentary cover is decoupled from the basement. Uh, let me use a better pointer. Um, the, uh, the surface uh, deformations are decoupled from the base through a large uh, detachment here. This is called a detachment. And you can see that at the surface, that the shortening of the layers due to the, 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 the compression due to the mountain building uh, occurs by folding of the layers and faulting. And you see these long folds that can be several tens of kilometers long and have slips of more than 10 kilometers. Um, this is an example from the Canadian Rockies, another one from the Southern Appalachians, another one from Western Taiwan. You see the scale, 10 kilometers. This is a bit more angular looking uh, cross section. These are drawings by geologists, of course, but they are constrained by surface, uh, surface data and by wells if present and by seismic data. Um, another setting is the accretionary wedges that occur at the plate limit uh, during a subduction. So this is a subduction, subducting plate. This is the, the top plate. This plate is moving down in the mantle and it's, the, the top plate is scrapping off the sediments that are coming from the ocean, forming an accretionary wedge. Also, some sediments may come from the land, on land, from the erosion on land. And these accretionary wedges, again, are delimited by a basal fault and they undergo essentially frictional uh, deformation. There are also uh, possible uh, interesting points in the tectonic extension. So this is the current rift, uh, a current rift cross section, where you see a large fault here with a lot of slip on it. And above that, you know, all the sediments are deformed and extended uh, down, down the, the, the slope above uh, an essentially undeformed basement. Other settings are gravitational collapse of, of sediments occurring usually at the, at the margins, uh, continental margins. This is Nigeria and this is the, um, the Niger Delta there, uh, which is offshore. And by accumulating sediments at the top uh, here, um, at, at the, uh, accumulating sediments coming from the land, the sediments are accumulating and by their own weight, they collapse, as you can see along these normal folds. And the collapse is occurring mainly towards the ocean. But in the ocean, there are also some sediments that are resisting the collapse. So we develop a, a compressive fold and thrust belt uh, at the bottom of the ocean here, coming from the, the collapse of, of the left-hand part here of, of the sediments. One important thing also, uh, central result on the behavior of rocks in general. You see granite, limestones, sandstones, uh, gneiss, uh, quartz, etc. Well, when they are put on the friction apparatus, uh, they show two uh, criteria that are Coulomb criteria. So they have a sensitivity to pressure. You see the, the shear stress increases with pressure. Um, and so that's the, the sensitivity, 0 0.85 here. And then they have also some cohesion, possibly. It depends on the, on the normal stress here. Uh, there are two, two, two parts. This criterion, first order criterion, of course, you see a lot of variations, holds 
for temperatures lower than 300 degrees. Uh, above that, the rocks become soft and they become ductile uh, materials. And these temperatures are usually corresponding to less than 10 to 15 kilometers. So uh, since limit analysis is essentially uh, interested to, uh, in frictional sediments, then this is why we must limit the, the, the investigations to 10 to 15 kilometers depth. Below that, we need to have other descriptions uh, of ductile de deformation. Uh, now, let's look at two experiments um, that are essentially keeping the ingredients that I just talked about in, in, in the tectonic settings. Um, you have here a, a sand layer that will be pushed by this wall to the right. So it has a basal detachment. It's a frictional material, cohesionless Coulomb material, and it's sliding on a glass base, so it's undeformable. And the base parallel compressive slip is applied. If you take this, um, uh, sorry, apparently, there you go. Um, this sand wedge, as you can see, is sliding freely on the base and no internal deformation except at the front of course where it's uh, where it's dying out this wedge looks almost the same but as we push on it you see that it's deforming at the wall making a sliding at the base and a thrust fault reaching the surface then next one here is growing then a third one is developing then a fourth one, and this is to first order a fold and thrust belt at the small scale, of course, of, of the lab. And you see that it develops an overall slope here that makes it stable because it has a, a steeper slope. And now it can slide without further deformation on the base uh, of the thing. So, so we see that there is a threshold because these, these two look very similar. There's clearly a threshold between the two. So if we take a now, this, uh, this uh, drawing, you can see that we had zero detachment dip and the, the, the box was horizontal, so we are on this line. And in the second experiment, we were unstable so that surface slope was not enough to make the wedge strong enough to slide. So it deformed so that the surface slope increases and comes into the stable regime. The first example was actually already in the stable regime, just above that line and therefore we was able to slide. So this is called, the description of this is called the critical Coulomb wedge theory, and it is the, the essential theory that people use in, in tectonic studies of, of shallow, shallow tectonic studies. If you increase again the slope, you fall into a B case, which is here, it's a gravitational collapse. So in the same theory, we can also describe collapse. We can also describe extensional wedges, and this is, it is here, the, the stable regime. Okay, so this theory has only a few parameters, surface slope, basal slope, friction, internal friction of the material, possibly cohesion and possibly over fluid overpressure, and friction on the base, the red base here, phi D, and overpressure on the base. These are the only parameters required. Uh, now, the modeling strategy I will now present is is somewhere in between <clears throat> two and members that are practiced today. Kinematic rules by essentially field geologists who uh, use geometry like the one I showed in Taiwan on the, the first slide. Uh, kinematic rules to ensure that they produce cross sections that are un unfoldable so we can we can go back and unfold them in time and so they produce an initial uh, structure that is that is uh, realistic. Um, and so they're very efficient, but they don't make any link to the rheology or to the stress field. Then there is a full problem that can be set up with complex sigma epsilon relations and solved using typically finite elements. Uh, but then you have to worry about compatibility between displacements and strain, equilibrium, and this poses some problems when there are faulting, when there is faulting appearing, which is the rule, of course, in, in surface tectonics. So we adopted the uh, limit analysis approach somewhere in between. It's a simplification of the full problem, but it's 
comparing to kinematic rules, it allows to put equilibrium in there and the maximum rock strength under the, the, the Coulomb uh, criterion, mostly. This is divided into two, two methods, a kinematic approach that gives an upper bound on the tectonic force and a static approach that gives a lower bound. And I'll present also a, a new twist, which is very important for us, is the sequential kinematic approach to go beyond first failure, because you saw that in the tectonic examples I showed you that contrary to geotechnic uh, structures, the nature is, it doesn't care about first failure. I mean, it goes on first failure and then it keeps failing and failing and failing for millions of years. Uh, so we need to follow beyond the first failure what's going on. Uh, more in more details, but Christian has certainly explained that in his seminars, etc. Uh, the limit analysis um, involves choosing a kinematically admissible velocity field, convex strength domain, principle of virtual work, which ensures mechanical equilibrium to yield an upper bound on the force. In other words, you find a solution, you have to guess a solution where the structure is failing. And therefore, the force that goes with it is, is upper bound. And you will try to minimize this upper bound in order to have the least upper bound somewhere here on the black line. The static approach consists in guessing a stress field, of course, that obeys the boundary conditions, adding the convex strength domain, the, the Coulomb criterion, and finding a lower bound. And then by optimization, you try to find the stress field that gives the maximum lower bound, and that's the black line below. And you end up with an uncertainty on the, on the value of the tectonic force. So and that's very comfortable to also be able to have an uncertainty on the determination of that force. We have two major implementations of limit analysis that we're using. There's a homemade software called SLAMTEC, sequential limit analysis method for tectonics, with an example here. And the well-known Optum G2 software and G3 software with examples here where the meshing, uh, there is a meshing, here there's no meshing. And therefore we can, we can put some, any, any type of, of material properties we want, we can define faults push on the left side to the, to the left, sorry, on the right side to the left, and produce through the kinematic approach a velocity field showing the active uh, faults, and through the static approach, the stress field, here is the pressure. So the slam tech uh, way uh, of working is the following. Um, first, we optimize a piecewise constant velocity field inspired by the observations and by the kinematic rules of the geologist. And here, this piece Y is uh, illustrated by this purple arrow, by this purple line. This is the flat fault, the active fault here, for example, for this one. And then it's emerging at the surface through ramp. And here is the hinge, that is the transition between the flat and, and the ramp. Uh, if we assume a, a kinematic field like this, it's rather simple to calculate analytically the, uh, the upper bound, uh, the, the Qmax uh, associated with that. You see the parameters of the bulk friction, detachment friction, beta is the angle of the base, this is zero here. Uh, gamma and theta are the angles of these two, two, uh, two folds. Phi r is the, is the friction angle on the ramp here. Uh, and that's it. And then you have rho, g, and that's it. You can compute the Qmax. And then you do the optimization by trying all these uh, purple uh, possibilities. And the minimum, uh, the one that gives you the Qmax minimum is the one that is predicted. Next, we perform a step of evolution. At this point, we can modify the topography with erosion or sedimentation. And we apply a step of shortening here on the left. And finally, we have to treat here the, the rheology of the thrust, the fourth, what we call the fourth thrust here, this fault, by weakening it. Uh, this is a very important ingredient to actually be able to reproduce some geological structures. So when it's created, it has the bulk friction of the pristine material. But as soon as slip is accumulated on it, the friction drops down to another set value. Uh, this is an example where 
we are pushing to the left this part. It's sliding at this base. The blue layer is just to show the formations. It's a passive marker. Active thrust uh, red. Uh, the active thrust is here, it's black, and the, the former ones are in red. And you can see that this is the force uh, at the back, the push force. It's dropping every time we create a new thrust because of the drop of friction on it. Then it's increasing because of the increase of relief on it. Then a new thrust appears. We have another drop on the friction, uh, uh, on the force, sorry, due to the dropping friction. Next one, etc. Um, I don't like this one, so let me just quickly show you this one, which I could not put in PowerPoint. This is an, another example with a much more fancy uh, graphics, uh, thanks to Bat Marie from a student, and with erosion. So what you see, you see the shadow here are the eroded part. And this is the evolution, and that's producing pretty complicated structures, as you can see. Um, and we have made all sorts of research projects to, to uh, develop that and show the different types of tectonic styles that we can obtain with respect to the various parameters of the simulation. Okay. Let's come back to this. And I'll pass on this one very quickly, but it's just to assure you that we verified Slamtech and it converges to the analytic solution of the critical Coulomb wedge theory. So I'll, I'll just go faster on that one. That one as well, if you want to know, uh, we can come back on it later. Uh, it's about uh, the convergence towards the critical value and the, the fact that sometimes it's difficult to find a minimum of the force because we you see we, we find a force that can vary only by a fraction of a percent. Um, now we have to do some experimental validation of SlamTech and for this we use sandbox modeling. This is the experimental data that I will present soon after. And this is the theory, the calculated data. How do we obtain calculated data? Well, we choose what we call a model in inverse problem theory. The model is in fact a set of, of, of friction parameters. As I said, uh, bulk friction, basal friction, maybe cohesions, uh, and weakening on the faults. And from this model, we can perform a numerical simulation Compare it to the experiments. This is an instrument of the misfit between the two, but in fact, the misfit is a number. So there's a formula to calculate the number according to the discrepancy between the two. And from this misfit, we can attribute to this model a probability that this model is the right one. So this is really applying inverse problem theory to a tectonic problem. Um, the experimental data now are here. Uh, again, uh, this would not go um, in so uh, in PowerPoint. So this is a, a view of this experiment. You see a side view through the glass wall of the box here. Uh, you see the left wall moving to the right, but in fact the base also is moving. So just think about it as if the right wall was moving to the left. <laughs> Uh, we take pictures of this during the, the, the experiments and we do a PIV analysis. So it's a computer analysis of the displacements of, of the grains. Sorry, let's put it again. Um, and that shows that this, we show here the rotational of the displacement field, which is a good proxy for showing shear. Uh, you see the, the fourth thrust here, the back thrust here, and you see the active shear as this is developing. Okay, we have a top view here of the box and here we have measurement of the force on the right hand wall the red force here and on the left hand wall the uh, the green force here uh, if the box was long enough this should always be zero so this is a side box, uh, size an effect due to the size of the box and these drops here are like you saw in the previous simulation using slam tech these are the, the drops in the force due to the weakening of the sand as we develop a shear belt. The grains are, get more space and they roll according to each other, uh, against each other, and they produce a, a, a weakening of the sand. Uh, so this is overall the, the experiments, and let's come back to this. 
So this experiment, we had one, one uh, fourth thrust, back thrust, and a second one appearing, and we measured uh, several observables that were the dips of the faults, gamma one, gamma two, theta one, theta two. We measured the distance between the two. We measured the distance of the uh, from the back wall of the first uh, thrust as well, and we also measured the force at the back. From these measurements, making a lot of measurements, we can produce statistical uh, description of the measurements and of their variability. And from these statistics, we can co then compute the misfit with the, the, um, with the simulations. And after about one million simulations, and this is where uh, the method has to be super fast, in fact, since it's a semi-identical method, it, it's quite fast. Uh, so one million simulations done on the computing grid at the university, we were able to produce full uh, a posteriori probability density uh, functions that are here. So basically, this is the stochastic result of the determination of, of the um, rheological parameters uh, by trying to match the experiments. Uh, and these are some independently measured values. And I will not discuss now the, these discrepancies, but what's important is that by doing this whole exercise of inverse problem, uh, we, can, we, we have improved both the experiments and the, the modeling. So, so it's a very demanding uh, task to do that inversion, uh, but it's extremely fruitful too, I think. And this is what we would like to do uh, for real data. Um, these are some examples that we are quite proud of. This is an experiment done in Montpellier by uh, Constantinov Scala and Malavier with sand and erosion, as you can see, uh, with a high friction base. So you have four thrusts uh, in this direction, mostly. And this is a simulation we did with SlamTech of that. Now, if you take the bottom, which is a very low friction base, that will produce a very different structures in, structures in the sand. And we were able to capture also uh, quite a few of the features, like, like some material going from the base. The black material here has been brought up to the surface through the thrusting and the erosion. That's what we also obtain here. Um, then there is Optum. Uh, I will not present the theory here because, uh, again, Christian is a much better specialist than me. But overall, uh, it's, just, it's really a, a finite element method where the unknowns are the stress uh, at the nodes. Um, and then the whole thing, uh, the whole problem, equilibrium, stress uh, uh, continuity, traction at the boundaries and the, the plasticity criterion are cast into a set of linear equations uh, with here something to optimize. Um, some examples quickly. Uh, one, one issue that appeared in the colleague, with the colleagues uh, doing experiments and numerical modeling of these things was they would not understand sometimes the result would give this situation where we had slip on the basal fault and then a fourth thrust and sometimes only directly a fourth thrust coming from the base of the wall. Um, and in fact, we propose an explanation simply by saying that it depends on the, on the friction on the back wall itself. High friction, the sun cannot, or the material cannot slide on it. Therefore, it will produce, it will activate the base uh, in order to avoid sliding on it. If the friction on the contrary is very low, then the material here will slide this direction, but also upward against that. Sorry. And we verified that with silicone and sand. Uh, here is sand against glass, so relatively high friction. We activate the base and we have a ramp and back thrust. But if we put silicone at the back and we go very slowly, this is like a very efficient lubrication, then we are more to five, close to five degree friction and then we obtain this. So it's pleasant. Another example is the push of a layer on a, free, on a low friction base and forced to climb up a ramp. If the ramp is weak, five degree friction, we obtain this with, with a hinge, uh, as I showed before, that, that's spontaneously occurring uh, through the optum calculation. Oh, by the way, the color code is the distance to the Coulomb criterion. So at zero, you have plastic failure. And for other, all of the colors, you are away from the failure. If you increase the friction, you have basically the same result, but the dip is lower, the dip of this, uh, this hinge. And if you increase even a little better, more the friction, then the whole thing is inactive, 
the blue line, and you obtain simply uh, this. Um, now, if we compare that to an analytic solution, because this is a simple case, um, then we obtain a very good uh, convergence between the process, which are the lower bounds produced by the static approach of Optum, and the straight line, which is the analytic solution by the kinematic approach. So this is the upper bound. So it's, it's slightly above the crosses, as it should be, but very close to them. Uh, now some case studies, because, uh, okay, I'm left with about 15 minutes of case studies. I guess you wanted to see some geology now. First case study is the Monterey in the northern Jura. Uh, sorry, there's only one R here, I made a mistake. Uh, this is uh, Lausanne, this is Genève, the Lac Léman, the Central Alps, the Molas Basin, and the Jura here. Uh, we are in the north part of the Jura right here. Uh, this is a, a fold, uh, that is, uh, this is the surface of the fold, this is a few kilometer long fold. Um, and these are, uh, this is a cross section that is very well constrained because there's a highway tunnel uh, going through the, the, the fold. So we have the dips all along it, we have some wells as well, and, and we have surface uh, data, of course, like you see on the pictures there. One feature that we looked at, uh, among several others in this paper by uh, Tiffen Kair, uh, one of the features is the fact that the backling here is very steep. You have 60 degrees uh, in the backling of this fold. And uh, the, 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 the limestone layers here uh, show some bedding perpendicular stilolite here. So they look like they have been um, compressed horizontally before being folding, folded. Um, so we try to model this uh, with SLAMTEC. First case here at the top, we apply 1.5 kilometer shortening to uh, an initial state that is uh, very simple. This is just the layers were not deformed at all. This is about 1.4 kilometer of a sedimentary pile above the detachment, which in Jura is a uh, Muschel calc uh, here, Triassic rock salt. So very, very soft rock at the base here. Um, if we remove all weakening on the faults, so that uh, we assume that the friction on the ramp is always equal uh, to the bulk friction, like if the ramp was always crossing a pristine material, then we obtain that kind of deformation, which is called a, a detachment fold with thickening of the beds. No faulting at all develops, but only thickening and, and, and folding, uh, as you can see. If, on the contrary, this is D, so D, 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 oh, let me come back to the laser pointer. D is here, so it's permanent um, uh, weakening on the faults from 30 down to 20 degrees friction. We obtain that kind of fold, pretty rigid fold, fold, uh, angular fold, uh, okay, fine, but you see that the dip here is not at all as steep as those ones, the real ones. Now, if we try to, for some reason that we, that I don't have the physical reason for it, but just explore the parametric space here. Suppose that for some reason there is no weakening, then there is some weakening, and then more, and then no more weakening. This is the shortening axis, sorry, from zero shortening, zero, 500 meters, one kilometer, 1.5. So if we assume that there are some periods where shortening occurs and some period where not, well, you obtain this one and this one, E and G, uh, which are E here or G here. Then we are able to produce the fold, the fold, and the steep backing here. So this is one exercise um, to reproduce uh, this, this particular feature of the fold. Uh, however, uh, no, sorry. Another, another problem that, that we addressed is the fact that the detachment is sometimes cut by a normal fold. Uh, this section is taken a bit, not far from the Monterey, a few, maybe 10, 20, 30 kilometers northeast of, of uh, the Monterey. And we see a structure that's one kilometer for the scale uh, with a lot of faulting here. Several slices have been faulted here. And just above a place where the detachment of rock salt has been cut by this fault here. And then there are deformations on the other side of this graben here made of Permian rocks on the other side. So the question is whether the deformation was able to pass this cut in, in, the, in the basement and 
be transferred all the way to, to, to the other side of the grammar, or if there was a fault coming from the bottom. So let's first study how, how, what condition we can pass a step, a downward step. So we make a little prototype in, with Optum G2, uh, with the real topography, uh, plus here, assuming a former topography of the Jura, which does not exist anymore today, but which must have been here somewhere. We take simply a slope of 15 degrees and we push. This is the result. If we don't put any ramps here, this is the result. We have a uniform material and no problem. It passes the, the little uh, cut here in the detachment. If, however, we're being more realistic and we add the ramps here, and the, the, these ramps being probably weaker than the material, then there is much less uh, of, of the, the displacement reaching the other side uh, of the structure. Uh, sorry, these colors are uh, the kinematic approach we used, and this is the virtual velocity field from zero to a max value in blue. So you see the sliding. If we change this relief, this assumed relief of 15 degrees down to 14, it doesn't pass anymore with the ramps. If we increase it to 18, it passes better. If we remove another here, the sediments that are the yellow sediments here, the sun tectonic sediments, if we remove them, then we create a little hole and the deformation cannot pass on the other side anymore. So we see that there are threshold, really threshold behaviors uh, in the solution. So we went to the, the sandbox and did the same exercise where this is the step here at the base, here, here, etc. We You see it through the, the red line and uh, we push from the right. So we do not prescribe a pre-existing relief, so we let just let it create itself. Um, so we push the wall to the left. After 2.4 centimeters, we have a first ramp and the first relief. And the second one is going is preparing. You see one, and then we push two, two and something centimeters, second, two more centimeters, number three, right here. Two more centimeters, number four, rooted just above the step. And then because the step is there, the, the life of the number four is much longer and we create a much higher relief and we put sun tectonic sedimentation. As you can see, the sun is fall, falling here on the surface uh, of, of the pre-existing layer. Um, and then a, a long time later, so it's like one, two, three, four, more than four centimeters later, we activate the number five here, which is much further away. And as the number five is, is also taking a, a long lifetime, and then we have six and seven, which are resuming the, the usual pace between the thrusting. So what we see is we produce, with sand tectonic sedimentation, we produce a lot of thrusting right there, a bit like here. And then we have a long flat syncline sliding that is here. And then we have another, again, uh, some thrusting at the other end. So optum analysis uh, helps us finding also the, the, the parameters that we must put in the sandbox to, to, to model this. Uh, one question I just posed also is whether there would not be some deformation coming from deep here and reaching this region from much deeper. So we change of scale. We now we see this is 20 kilometers, so this is like more than 100 kilometers. We go from the central of, uh, center of the Alps, here the topographic high of the Alps, Molas Basin, the Jura, and then the plain. Um, and we push from further, much further away at this level. And we see whether we can activate the Jura here. Um, one set of, so, so we have two parameters for to vary the solutions. One is the friction on, on this detachment, the Muschel calc. Uh, rock salt detachment of the Jura that goes all the way to here. And the other one is some assumed detachment in the middle of the, the continental crust. If we choose two and three degrees, very low friction values, I, I agree, we can talk about this. Uh, we push there and we have deformation reaching much beyond the Jura that is not realistic, so we put a little gray color. If we change the values, we obtain what we call thick skin so that there is a, a major fault crossing the Jura from, from deep in the crust. And this is, uh, by the way, here you have a close-up of this region. 
Here, by choosing other values, one and four degrees, we obtain both deformation coming from, from deep and activation of the, the upper detachment, as you can see here. And so the Jura can grow, but is also perturbed by deformation coming from below the detachment. Pure thin skin is when the uh, deformation of the base does not reach the Jura, so it stops here close to the molas basin, but it's activating slightly the upper detachment. And finally, no tectonics in the Jura at all for other values. Now, uh, these are two, two parameters, so we can make a map. And here's the map. This cross-section that you saw, the five cases, are the black dots in this map. And this is the cross-section taken, the, the, the path of the cross-section that we considered. And this is the close-up uh, that we were looking at here. So from these five points, and we perform much more simulations, and we can map the different tectonic styles with colors, as you can see, um, in, this, in this map. So gray and gray are unrealistic, and yellow, green, and blue are different tectonic styles. And then we can repeat the exercise through several cross-sections that uh, were published in the literature and see how they evolve uh, from west to east in the Jura. And you can see that the, uh, we, we would think that there is more um, uh, thin skin on this side of the Jura and probably more thick skin or deep deformation on the east side of the Jura. I'm realizing that I'm taking too much time. I'm, I've got, I announced I was going to finish in two minutes, but I have a few slides more. Um, so please excuse me uh, if it's too long. I just want to present this one because I thought that there are two here, two, two very nice results. This, this time on a completely different uh, setting, which is a, uh, coming back to subduction setting. This is the subduction. This is a South America, Chile coast. There has been a huge earthquake, Maule earthquake there a few years ago. And uh, Nadaya and Pauline Souliniak have performed an analysis where, with Optum, where they assume that um, some of the structures observed there are due to changes uh, along changes of friction along the subduction interface here. So if we assume that we have low friction deep in the in the interface, intermediate high friction at close to the surface, and we slide on this, we produce two uh, backward uh, faults or, or faulting regions here. If, on the contrary, we have high, medium, low friction, then we have faults on the other side, you can see. And if we have a very strong relief, uh, uh, change between 18 degrees here and 2 degrees at the front, then we have not only a sliding there, but we have a normal faulting, so that this is actually going, moving to the left faster than this part. So that's quite unexpected. And it's what I find really nice is that the, uh, this is actually when we apply that to a cross section here or there, these two, two cases, where well, we see that in, in, uh, in this case, indeed, we can find parameters 14 to less than four degrees where we produce a normal fault. That is indeed, that was um, assumed to exist by looking at the aftershocks of the major earthquakes. Another one is uh, here, the other example is. Uh, if we change from 8 to 14 degrees at the base, then we produce, uh, Optum says that we should produce a reverse fault with this shape, and the gray line here are the actual existing faults that were not prescribed in, uh, in Optum, so it found them uh, spontaneously. Uh, another example uh, is in uh, northern Sumatra, where there is a wrong, what we call wrong wave thrusting. Normally, these faults should be dipping like this towards the deep sea on the left, and this is the continent uh, to the right. This is again a, a subduction interface, but this is the very tip of the, of the interface. Uh, this is the sea bottom, uh, of course. Uh, and so in two cases in the world, in northern Sumatra and in the Cascadia in Pacific Ocean, um, we have reverse faults, so the, the faults are going the other way. Now using a, a modification of SLAM tech, uh, Nadia and Pauline again were able to uh, making com put a competition between backward faults and forward faults and to make a map of effective coefficient of friction in the bulk and uh, sorry in the bulk here internal and effective friction coefficient at the base um, and they show that 
it is possible to produce these awkward landward, what we call landward is these, these folds, uh, awkward landward folds in a very narrow and very, very, very low regime of the effective basal friction from 0.02 to 0 0.005. Uh, then landward is possible. And then they go on an argument that these, these very low values may be acquired in a dynamic manner by uh, thermal pressurization uh, uh, at the interface. Um, now I'll skip this because I prefer to maintain the time as I said and to have time for questions. But this is a study of the gravity instability in sedimentary deltas. Uh, and this is Nigeria, again, going back to Nigeria. Um, and the general idea is simply that with SLAMTEC again, here, by producing a new prototype for SLAMTEC, then we were able to account both for the, 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 the gravitational collapse along normal folds here, but also the linked compression at the, at the bottom of the, the slope here. And this increases the size of the stable domain of the critical Coulomb wedge theory here by a few degrees on the surface slope, so it is not uh, very small. Uh, it's substantial. Uh, the perspectives, uh, one thing that we would love to do is to couple SLAMTEC and OPTUM G2 in an automatic manner. This is a first attempt, a very first attempt. SLAMTEC on the left, OPTUM G2 stress determinations on the right. Uh, we would also like to develop 3D. Uh, 3D approaches with Optum G3. This is an early work by Sulum Pulin in 2009. And finally, my conclusions. There are many advantages using limit analysis. We bypass the complications and, and the transition to faulting, which poses some severe difficulties when using finite elements and the full problem. We can account of true faults with large slips, which is a rule in, in shallow tectonics. The theory is simply sufficiently simple that we can even produce partial analytical solutions. And the computational efficiency is very important because it allows us to perform stochastic modeling. Some difficulties well known is how to address seismicity and ductility, of course. Uh, one more thing that we face, a difficulty we face is that, in fact, there are very, very few geoscience research groups developing LA and therefore, uh, it's not easy to be to be alone and to uh, in a group to develop uh, such methods. Maybe we should teach limit analysis in geoscience programs, which, to my knowledge, are, is, is 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 practically absent. Thank you to the geotechnics techniques engineers for bringing useful theories and methods for to us. Maybe the sequential LA I showed could be useful for you guys in geotechnics if you're interested in what happens a bit beyond the first failure. For example, to assess uh, the damage that can cause, that can be caused by, by a failure of something. So go, go further in the failure and see how things is, are going to collapse. Um, oh, and by the way, we may have a PhD project coming soon for start of work in October, 2020. Um, and if you're interested in doing such studies, uh, we look for some, somebody uh, rather good on programming and geotechnics and, and mechanics. Um, for that project. Thank you. Oops, I took five more minutes. Yeah, that's okay, but thank you. It was very, very interesting. Thanks for uh, sharing all your work and explaining how you use limit analysis in your, uh, in your, in your work. Uh, I think there are not so many questions actually, but I have one while people are getting uh, typing here and, and that is, uh, I think what many of the uh, people listening in here might have the same question. Uh, and it's, it's, it's a very basic thing that comes down to, let's say, practical usage. That's one of the things I remember when I first started learning about your work that what, what's, so how, how do you use this in, in, in practice, right? So I, can you mention some practical applications like the hydrocarbon exploration, for example, talk a little bit about that. So how you could, how you're use, using the methods in this field. So how, how are you, how are you finding oil using limit analysis or, or your methods, for example? Right? <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, we, 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 we don't find oil. Uh, that is not our job. Yeah, no, <laughs> uh, exactly. We don't decide where to drill a well. Um, 
this is not our job. Thank God. I mean, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. we are academics and we're doing, uh, we, in, in particular at the Jack Lab, we are uh, trying to develop methods uh, yes. rather than doing uh, dedicated practical analysis of special cases. However, we must at some point indeed deal with real cases. As I showed, this is why I showed several, several applications. Um, uh, and this is, for example, one uh, that was done with Total and with Yves Leroy, uh, who, who is now at Total. Um, and the, uh, the idea is, I mean, you have to realize that uh, when interpreting, the problem is to have um, reliable images of the underground. Exactly. How to image the underground. Not on, even the friction parameters are not, not always very important for hydrocarbon, of course. But how to have a good picture of the underground? Well, we have seismic data, yeah. we have uh, wells, and we have surface data, uh, and that's it, approximately. Yeah. And then we have some more geophysical data, like uh, gravity, but they, they don't help very in the details. Um, and then, at some point, the, the geologist must draw the cross-section. Yes. Uh, and uh, so he has these tools at hand, uh, but he does not all, it's always the solutions. Are, there are several solutions possible, several interpretations possible. Uh, and that is a, a problem for the geologist, of course. And yeah. he needs criteria to choose between various poss possible scenarios, uh, kinematic scenarios, etc. He, he's interested not only in the structure, but also in the evolution, past evolution that brought the structure as it is today. Yeah. Uh, and therefore, he needs at some point some modeling tool. And as I explained in the strategy, uh, um, uh, slide at the beginning, yeah. uh, the tools available up to the 80s were only kinematic. Uh, do you see my, my screen, yeah, by the way? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, so they only had kinematic rules. Um, no link to the, the mechanical equilibrium, for example. No link to the maximum rock strength. Um, so there also they had problems of choosing which scenario uh, w w and they were looking for more more constraints. Now the full problem on the other side, uh, simply the resolution of this problem did not exist in the 80s and now it's been doing a lot of progress but it's still having a lot of difficulties with surface uh, tectonics. Okay. When you go deep in the, in, in the earth, uh, m things become much more ductile and the classical methods are much better uh, set up for that. Uh, so we needed something okay. in between. Uh, and, yeah. and that's the, uh, the answer I can give you is a very broad answer, but it's a, it's a help to choose between uh, inter various interpretations of, of the underground. It's, this uh, offers a help. Uh, because you can yeah, yeah. you can relate it to rock properties and to mechanical equilibrium. Exactly. Uh, it, it's interesting, actually, that um, because there's a I think there's an analog to that in in engineering as well, where um, we know that limit analysis, the assumptions regarding the material uh, behind limit analysis are fairly simple, and we know that the world probably is more complex than that, but still, limit analysis gives you, um, has the advantage that uh, it very often gives you really quite crucial insights at not a very high price um, as, as compared to full-blown finite element analysis. So, so, so uh, that's, that's in, very interesting to hear. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, we sort of, we found several problems that there were both in, in, in analog modeling by the way, in doing that. So we, we pr published several papers that I did not show about improving the precision of analog modeling, for example. Um, and, and also uh, by doing this, we, we find several times, like, like I showed one or two, um, very simple explanations to structures that people were looking at and did not really understand the, the reason for them. Yeah. I see... I see some questions here. Yeah, there is a good question here, actually, uh, Bertrand, that, that yes. I think you also already answered that that could maybe be relevant to the PhD position. I don't know. As you so showed, in the, the guy here, Karim, is asking, as you showed in your experience, the faults and slip planes are formed progressively, as you do with Slamton, right? Can you reproduce that with Optum? Or 
you just or can you just predict the first failure? Uh, so. Can well, you, well to yeah. only predict the first failure. Indeed. Exactly. Do exactly. oh, you want to answer this? Yeah, please. No, no, no. I, 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 I think that is the answer. But is this something that you would like to develop going on? Uh, in the PSG project? Is this part of the PSG project? No, this uh, is not part of the PSG project. Uh, okay. I don't think so. The details of the formation of the fault plane, indeed, that's uh, uh, in Slam Tech, we simplify it by saying simply there was no fault, now there's a fault. Exactly. Um, and we don't look at the details of that. However, no. we, 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 we have some detail in it by saying that the fault, as it's formed, it has the bulk friction, the pristine material friction, and then it's, uh, it will drop down uh, with slip accumulated on it. So, so yeah. in, in a way, yes, there is the concept of a, of a maturity of a fault, if you want. Okay. Of the lifetime of a fault. Yeah. Um, and, um, but the I, details I, of, of, if you look at Optum, often, if the fault is not predefined, Optum will give a certain width uh, to the shear zone that yeah. looks like a fault. And SlamTech will not give no width to this, zero width. Okay. So going from one to the other is indeed a, some question that is of interest, uh, yeah, but yeah. I don't intend to. Uh, it's not in the in, no. in the current project. Okay. I see uh, also some questions on on dilatancy. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, dilatancy, you know, is it, very important in rock physics because we can see it in the lab uh, with rock samples. Uh, there is clearly dilatancy uh, uh, if the if the normal pressure is not too high. Uh, but this dilatancy is very limited to low low slips. I mean, once once you have reached a certain amount of slip on on a fault, uh, well developed fault, then there is no dilatancy anymore. And at the scale of geology, dilatancy is 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 not an important uh, process. Uh, it may be important in at the field scale when you we have. Uh, the uh, microstructural signs of dilatancy, indeed, but at the at the large scale of large structures folding several kilometers, dilatancy appears to be uh, negligible. Uh, so, so we don't look at that very much, uh, indeed. And as you saw, Islam Tech uh, puts no dilatancy at all uh, in the in the in the evolution. There's a, uh, if I may just, there's a comment as well here. It's uh, from uh, Eve from Po, ah. who says that uh, regarding what, relating to what we were talking about before, um, about the hydrocarbon exploration, where he, um, he points out that um, you get the stresses out of the optimum analysis as well. Um, so slam tech is great for the evolution of the, the whole thing, the thrusting sequences and so on. But with, uh, with optimum, you, you do get, as you would with, with, say, more conventional finite elements, you get the complete stress field as well, which is, um, which is uh, quite important uh, for, uh, for um, Absolutely. In, in making decisions on, on where to drill. Yeah, thank you, Yves Leroy, for this. <laughs> really Thanks, Yves. Recalling me how important is the stress field that we get with <laughs> Optum. And this is something that is, that is indeed very sexy for, for the industry. Um, yeah. Very attractive, uh, not only the, the industry for hydrocarbon, but also the one uh, that we, the project that we have currently, is, would be financed by the Swiss uh, institutions, and it's uh, in the framework of uh, underground uh, radioactive waste. And there also, uh, the stress is important, and uh, even the evolution over a million years uh, is is uh, of interest. Uh, so, so we. That's where the coupling between SlamTech and Optum would, would be very interesting, so that we can do evolution and follow the stress field at the same time during the evolution. And if I may ask a question, uh, Bertrand, you showed uh, one of your first slides was uh, you showed sort of the more Coulomb envelope, kind of a curved uh, more Coulomb envelope for rock. Yes. Uh, and you showed there was a, it, it's actually not a straight line. It, it is slightly curved, right? There's two. Yes. There's two straight lines there, as far mm -hmm. as I can see. Um, yes. Is that is, is it just to make an, a, a comment on that with respect to geotechnical applications? Because that's something we see for, for most geomaterials, actually, that there is this uh, stress level dependency on the friction angle. Uh, so for sand, 
this is something that's that's well known that the friction angle at lower stress levels is is higher than at, at high stress levels so your slope down there near the origin is higher than than further up um, we have actually a couple of models in optum to take that into account uh, that kind of nonlinearity so my question was to you if that would be something that would be um, of interest to include this nonlinearity or, or is it uh, is is Coulomb this classic Coulomb good enough uh, do, do you reckon wow I've never thought of uh, introducing that no uh, oh. uh, It was it, 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 the, the model you if you're no. talking about the GSK model, right, Christian? The nonlinear. That's right. Yes. Yes. Yeah. This change of slope here from point yeah. eighty-five to point six. Yeah. Uh, okay. No, you know this. This is really a very first-order determination here, taking all sorts of rocks. I mean, when we do <clears throat> actual cases, we look at particular rocks, and. Uh, <coughs> then we have determinations that are uh, more precise than this. I mean, they, 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 they're not as spread as these ones. Um, but maybe behind that, there is something fundamental that I... No, no, I mean, it's just, we, we in, in, in geotechnics, uh, Coulomb is, is what's used in, in the vast majority of cases as well. But sometimes you do run into situations where you would kind of like to do things a little where, where, where this nonlinearity can actually explain some things that you observe that are not compatible with the with the Coulomb um, criterion. So well, yeah, in, in, this happened indeed, and sometimes we had to do that. But it's um, um, not on the on the slope of the line, but rather on on here on the negative part. Uh, with sometimes you want to put a cut off. On this, uh, on the envelope, with so you would have the envelope going there with its cohesion, and then here you want to put a cutoff to um, to explain a limited resistance to tension. Also, it can be useful to put a cutoff there in compression as well for porous rocks, where uh, sure. there's a limit where uh, the normal stress is such that the pores will collapse, and yes, yes, uh, yes. and so so there's also a, a finite resistance to compression. Uh, these um, so that, these are that the ingredients we have added yeah, sometimes. Sure, sure. Yeah, that, that is included in Optum uh, G2, yeah, exactly. uh, the compression cap, as we call it. So right. basically yeah. being able to limit the, 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 the pressure you have. Um, there's, an, there's a question, uh, uh, Bertrand, on your sandbox models. Um, do they contain different horizontal layers from a rheological point of view? Uh, the ones I showed, no. Faults. They are simply, uh, yeah, uniform sand, but the colors that you could see are simply dyed sand. It's the same sand that's been dyed with uh, oxides in order to visualize the deformation. Uh, but no, why uh, we, keep, we keep it very simple, these experiments, because we have, uh, we don't try to reproduce exactly real situations or cases. Uh, but we try to make things simple enough that we can reproduce them with, with SlamTech or Optum and, um, and learn from that. Um, but there are uh, hundreds of papers on, of course, on, on analog modeling, physical modeling using sand and various types of sand, various types of other, other materials uh, to, to do that, to, to, to put some layering. However, SlamTech, as, as I showed it to you, uh, assumes a, a uniform material because if it's not uniform then this type of faulting will not occur i mean if you if this layer for example was very weak the fault here would not be straight it would probably go into longer time here in the weak layer before going up it would not be straight etc so this simplification would not be valid um, so this is one of the, the serious uh, limitation in need of slam tech so far okay and just another geological question. Do you have a case study where both thrust and normal faults exist together at the same time? Well, yes, uh, this is the one I showed, for example, uh, in the collapse uh, here. Or you have normal faulting here. 
uh, due to the self weight of the soft sediments. So they collapse and then they they're going to slide where there is room and that's towards the ocean. And by collapsing, they will slide on the detachment and then they will form compression here at the ocean bottom. So we have all of that. And we were able to, to, to construct with a, during the PhD of Xiaoping Yuan, uh, a model um, uh, dedicated slam tech uh, implementation, coupling the, the, the normal faulting to the thrust faulting here. And that's because precisely of the resistance of the thrust at the toe there of the wedge, that we increase the, the stability region uh, of the critical wedge here. So that's okay. an example. I hope it answers sure. the question. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. I think so. I think uh, we've uh, passed the time, 10 minutes. I think that is all for today, folks. Uh, Bertrand, thanks a lot for uh, participating and, and sharing this work. Very interesting. Well, yes, I'm glad, you, you know, uh, I yeah. owe you guys so much with nah. Optum that, you know, when I... <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Likewise, and, and I think yeah. also uh, just say hello to Eve in Po. Thanks, Eve, for... Uh, listening in also and for your comments yeah uh, thank you Eve. yeah yeah so uh, let's call it a day and uh, don't forget next thursday uh, we have a another interesting webinar completely different topic sheet pile walls is that something you're in uh, interested in uh, Bertrand? <laughs> <laughs> well I, I have to look at what is that you know? <laughs> what is that <laughs> Sheet pile rolls. Yeah, it's not. It's not, it's not, not, this, uh, yeah, not it's, it's not sheet pile, but sheet pile rolls, right? Yeah, I, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah yes. <laughs> so no, it's, uh, it's 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 actually very interesting. I don't know if it's it's as interesting as this stuff. It's it's a different, uh, more engineering, I think. Yeah. 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 Okay. Have a have a great uh, day tomorrow in, in in Denmark. We have uh, holidays tomorrow, so uh, yeah, tomorrow here too. Mm. Okay, okay, good, good. good. Yeah, so enjoy the weekend and uh, and we'll stay in touch. Yeah. Thank you very Great. much. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you, bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.